All right. So today's work uh, will cover a variety of projects uh, from uh, uh, our research group, uh, which is a laboratory for parallel numerical algorithms. Uh, and we're in the computer science department here at Illinois. Uh, we do work on related to quantum simulation and tensor computations. Uh, and especially taking this more broadly, that's perhaps the majority of the work the group does. But we also actually do work on other topics, uh, including graph algorithms uh, and eigenvalue problems and preconditioners uh, for interior point maps, for example. Um, but today I will, of course, focus on the stuff that's actually relevant to IQUIST. Um, uh, I'll start out with some motivation uh, and applications, especially from quantum chemistry. Uh, these will kind of motivate uh, tensor contractions and tensor decompositions. Then I'll uh, go back to tensor networks uh, and motivate further applications there. And on both of these topics, I'll uh, summarize uh, a number of projects that our group has been involved in throughout uh, the last years, and especially very recently. Um, so to just establish a little bit of terminology that I'll use throughout, so I'll say a tensor has an order n. So a tensor is some, you can think of as a multidimensional array, but it's also equipped with some uh, algebraic properties. So the order is the number of modes or dimensions, uh, and the dimensions themselves are uh, the sizes of the modes. So uh, for example, a matrix has order two, but has dimensions m by n. Um, so we'll talk about tensor contractions. These are essentially matrix multiplications or matrix vector products uh, generalized to tensors. Uh, so there's a whole uh, general kind of algebra we have for contracting tensors in different ways, and you'll see more examples later. Uh, tensor decompositions uh, are kind of the opposite of tensor contraction in a sense. In tensor contraction, we contract tensors to produce another one. In tensor decomposition, uh, we take a tensor and factorize it. Usually in factorizing, we're aiming to gain either some information or to compress the tensor. So we'll usually express a given tensor as a contraction of smaller ones. Uh, tensor network methods are related to tensor decompositions very closely, but uh, I think the main distinction is that with tensor network methods, we are working, uh, we're never working with a big tensor that we're factorizing. We're usually working with implicit representation of a big tensor, and we want to learn something about that big tensor without ever forming it, for example, compute eigenvalues. Uh, so in the first part of the talk, we'll focus on contraction and decomposition, and then the second part, uh, I'll talk about uh, tensor networks, and that second part will be most relevant to uh, quantum circuits. Uh, the first part will be uh, predominantly quantum chemistry. So uh, to briefly summarize some tensor decompositions that will come back throughout this talk, and also to introduce folks to the tensor diagram notation, which I will use uh, excessively throughout this talk. Uh, so a, a CP decomposition of the tensor uh, for an order three tensor expresses it uh, as a, a sum of tensor products of columns of three matrices. These are called factor matrices. Uh, and the rank, it, supposing this is exact, is R. So we can think about this as a tensor diagram. So here, uh, a circle represents the tensor T, and I, J, K are the legs. Uh, and we have one new mode that unites these three factor matrices, and we sum over the index that iterates over that mode. Um, so that's just one type of decomposition we can do. And it turns out that CP is kind of ubiquitous and pops up all over the place, and we'll see it both in uh, quantum chemistry uh, and elsewhere. Um, but another very important type of uh, tensor network is just kind of the 1D tensor network, uh, which is in physics usually referred to as the matrix product state. Uh, in tensor decomposition literature, it's referred to as tensor train. Here we take each uh, the factor matrix and chain adjust to the next uh, factor, which is actually going to be a tensor, which will be chained to another tensor up until the end, uh, which is again a factor. And we sum over all of these intermediate modes. So there's, um, of course, disadvantages and advantages between these. Here, B is an order three tensor. So if these ranks are not small, we may not have compressed T. While here, if this rank is small, we've compressed everything. And it's kind of a low order decomposition in a sense that we took an order three tensor and expressed it only using matrices. Uh, but tensor train is especially powerful if we have a, a tensor with many, many modes, uh, in which case we can express it as this 1D tensor network. And that's especially important in tensor network methods, where we'll never actually work with an explicit uh, form of the tensor. So this will come back later in the talk. Um, further, kind of naturally, if we have 1D, there's also 2D tensor networks. Uh, and uh, these are also quite important in computational physics. Uh, and we can draw a tensor diagram that looks like this. And here is maybe the first hint of why we want to use tensor diagrams. Writing the equations for this thing would be a mess. Uh, so while with the tensor diagram, we now kind of have some intuition for these uh, modes that connect to circles are things we sum over, so they're indices we sum over, uh, while modes that point into legs that point into outer space 
our indices we don't sum over that contribute to uh, the output tensor. Okay. Okay. So uh, the application that is, is kind of the main goal of all, almost everything I will be talking about is to uh, solve the many body Schrodinger equation. I'll focus, at least for now, on the time independent case. Uh, there's many reasons we would want to do this. This is kind of the uh, fundamental thing we want to do in quantum chemistry, uh, uh, as well as in for many conditional physics applications. So uh, typically we have some Hamiltonian operator H, uh, which is self-adjoint Hermitian, uh, and we want to find some wave function uh, that uh, uh, minimizes the energy. We can also consider uh, Computing higher eigenstates, in which case this is not just a minimization but an eigenvalue problem. But for simplicity, I'll focus just on this uh, as a minimization problem for the ground state energy. Um, so, in almost all applications that we'll care about, H is represented as a sum of local operators. So, each of these H1 uh, through Hm, where we have m terms, uh, in a sense should be acting on either just a couple of qubits. So, later will be uh, a quantum gate acting on a circuit. Um, or it could be a particle-particle uh, interaction term, for example, a potential, um, depending on the context we're working with. So uh, in a spin system models, we might have uh, a single operator or O of one operators per site. Uh, well, for electronic structure calculations, if we have a basis set that's proportional to the size of the uh, number of electrons we're studying, uh, then the number of terms is usually O to the fourth. Uh, although some of them might vanish uh, due to distance of interactions between faraway particles. Um, but often we have to deal with them for fourth complexity. Uh, specifically in electronic structure, uh, the Hamiltonian can be written in this form, where, uh, at least for today, I'll certainly focus on uh, the last term, which is uh, the, uh, the two particle component, which encodes electron electron interactions and causes all the trouble. Uh, so the way that uh, one usually approaches uh, working with such a Hamiltonian in quantum chemistry is by imposing an ansatz on the wave function and then trying to uh, optimize that ansatz in so far as possible. So in doing so, one is kind of searching over a subspace of solutions uh, uh, and kind of trying to find some kind of minimizer. In density functional theory, uh, we write uh, this wave function, which is a function of all the particles, uh, as a product of uh, single particle wave function. So here xi is the location of particle i. Um, while in Hartree Bach, uh, instead of considering the product, uh, we take the determinant of uh, these single particle wave functions. Uh, the determinant uh, arises here because the result will explicitly be anti-symmetric, uh, which is something we want if we want to simulate fermions, since we want to correctly model uh, exchange forces. Um, However, both of these models, Hartree Fock and uh, DFT, uh, don't really do a great job of uh, taking into account electronic correlation and excitations, uh, which is captured by the coupled cluster model, which starts from Hartree Fock and then augments it by uh, operators that, in a sense, are meant to model excitations and particle particle interactions. Uh, and there's various types of coupled cluster methods. The CCSD is the most popular and includes the singles and doubles, which are these T1 and T2 tensors. And I'll talk about that in a little bit uh, more. Any questions so far? I guess not. Uh, so if we consider the expectation value of uh, uh, the two electron operator for the hartree fock ansatz, uh, we arrive at a tensor, uh, and this is kind of my point in trying to present a little bit of quantum chemistry here is to show where tensor computations actually show up uh, in quantum chemistry. Uh, so once we impose some kind of, once we provide some kind of basis functions uh, for, uh, for the kind of, which are spatial, we can express each uh, single particle wave function as a linear combination of these. Uh, and then we can write uh, this expectation value in terms of the contraction of these coefficient matrices uh, and uh, some integrals, which are uh, in physics and chemistry commonly denoted in notation like this, uh, which is really just saying that this tensor has indices i, k, j, l. Uh, and specifically, this tensor is given by this expectation value, uh, which is which can be written out as a two electron integral uh, and computed uh, and doesn't depend on the coefficients themselves. Um, this tensor in, uh, in parentheses is, is called the ERI electron partial integral tensor. So the ERI tensor has a number of interesting properties. It has permutational symmetries. So if you interchange its modes, its values stay, stay the same. 
Uh, and it also has group symmetry due to conservation laws, which means that many of the blocks inside the tensor are entirely zero. Um, and this all depends on the particular system and method that we're working with. Um, however, in general, these kind of almost always pr permit some, some reduced representation that allows us to save costs, as does permutational symmetry. But in both cases, it's non-trivial to exploit. And we'll see that uh, when we talk about computational methods for these problems. Uh, so the hartree fock method computes these uh, coefficients iteratively via the self-consistent field SCF procedure. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of that. Uh, uh, it's uh, kind of reasonably inexpensive aside from having to actually compute the integral tensor and having to do uh, some linear algebra. But there's not a lot of tensor computations that are actually interesting in that part. Um, what I want to get to really is a couple of cluster methods, which uh, are widely used in quantum chemistry and are predominantly based on contractions of tensors, uh, which is kind of the first core tensor computation I want to talk about. So in a couple of cluster, uh, we define uh, this couple cluster wave function as something that acts on the hartree fock wave function. Um, and to figure out how to actually uh, optimize T1 and T2, uh, we can expand this expectation value uh, or kind of similar quantities. And what ends up happening is that if we expand the exponential, we can show that many of the contractions of T uh, with the representation of uh, psi HF, which is pr predominantly described by this two electron integral tensor, um, many of the terms vanish. Uh, so in fact, one is left only with terms that are, for example, this T2 tensor contracted with the integral tensor contracted again with T2. Uh, and these can be derived via so-called Goldstone diagrams, uh, which are here below, which are much like tensor diagrams that I showed before, except here each line uh, that is kind of physical this way and this dashed line actually denote a different tensor, uh, while the arrows can also be used to infer uh, symmetry information about the two tensors. Uh, these diagrams uh, denote contraction between two or more tensors. Then these expressions are usually refactorized, and the CCSD method ends up looking like something like 50 contractions, uh, any one of which is at most as expensive as O of n to the sixth, uh, where both T and the integral tensor are of size of O of n to the fourth. Um, and depending on the couple cluster method we use, we would get contractions that are higher order. So for the CCSD T method, which includes the T3 uh, uh, tensor, which is the triples, we, we would get a cost of O of n to the eighth. Uh, and would, would have a tensor of size O of n to the six. Um, so these methods are uh, quite rich in tensor contractions, um, but they also have this high scaling in cost. Uh, so this can be resolved with the use of appropriate uh, tensor decompositions uh, or with the use of sparsity. So if we want to go away from the O of n to the six scaling, which is kind of prohibitive with respect to system size, uh, we can do a technique called density fitting which uh, can be thought of as a matrix fact, a low rank matrix factorization of uh, an unfolding of the, uh, of the two electron integral. Here by unfolding, I mean some kind of matrixization that takes a couple of modes uh, and treats them as rows and another couple of modes and treats them as columns of some matrix. Uh, but also we can write this in Einstein's summation notation uh, as the following factorization, which can be computed via pivoted Cholesky. Uh, and these factors are the same. So the, uh, and this is also shown here. So this is our tensor with legs A, B, I, J. Um, and what we're doing is factorizing it into two tensors. Uh, here the arrows really denote in a sense kind of symmetry, which for now could be ignored. So you could just consider the boxes and the outside legs. Um, but it also shows to some degree that these factorizations are respecting symmetries in the system. Uh, the, one can also further reduce the cost. So with this Ch Cholesky factorization, one can show that the rank is like O of n instead of O n squared, which would be kind of the naive non-pivoted Cholesky. Uh, and consequently, the cost of the method uh, that uses uh, uh, this electron integral tensor starts to be only one to the five, not O of n to the six. Uh, one could theoretically obtain O of n to the fourth by using the tensor hypercontraction method, uh, which takes a CP decomposition of uh, this density fitting tensor. So here we take one of these factors and we express it as a contraction of three matrices, which all have one mode that's joined in between them. Uh, and we do that to each D, so each part. So overall, we get this factorization of the initial tensor into six parts that also uh, uh, respect the number of symmetries. So these X factors are repeated and the D factors are the same too. Um, and kind of, that's good. But so a challenge here is computation of the CPD composition, which is often actually relatively high rank, uh, which makes it hard. 
uh, and uh, the sensor can be quite large as well. Um, so a little bit more to say about uh, the tensor hypercontraction method. Uh, so uh, an, an alternative to using an explicit CPD composition of this density being intermediate tensor uh, is to consider some kind of interpolation onto a spatial grid uh, and to uh, use the grid to obtain in effect the same type of factorization. Um, this has been shown to be kind of more effective than using numerical optimization for tensor decomposition, uh, but it doesn't extend well to uh, cases when you want to use a uh, couple cluster on periodic systems. Uh, which are very important for modeling solid state systems. So there is still a reason to try to think about how to effectively compute CP decomposition of this tensor, which is something I'll talk about shortly. But before that, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, this first primitive that we saw in quantum chemistry, uh, tensor contractions. Uh, and this motivated uh, us or me really to start developing Cyclops about a decade ago now uh, when I was a graduate student. Uh, which has now evolved and a lot of people have since contributed. But initially this thing started as kind of a domain specific language for uh, quantum chemistry methods that use tensor computations. Uh, since then we've used it for all kinds of stuff. Uh, in general, Cyclops supports uh, sparse and dense uh, uh, generalized, by, by generalized I mean one can use other rings than uh, plus and times uh, tensor algebra. Uh, and it also has many primitives to manipulate tensor data. Uh, and the main thing that Cyclops offers that you might not find in other libraries such as say TensorFlow is that we distribute each tensor over a distributed memory system and we find uh, communication efficient algorithms for contraction. So this library is really designed to use supercomputing level systems uh, where we have many nodes uh, uh, acting together in order to work on one very big tensor. Um, right. Uh, so Cyclops was developed in C++ but we now have a Python interface which is increasingly being used. Uh, Cyclops has been used in quantum chemistry code, so it's been integrated into QCAM and PyCF, which are two of the uh, most widely used quantum chemistry libraries. Uh, and it's also, as I'll talk about a little bit later, been used for quantum circuit simulation. And I won't talk about its uses for graph analysis and other stuff, because that's kind of outside of our scope today. So uh, CTF provides, uh, Cyclops provides this Einstein style notation, which defines a contraction by specifying indices for each tensor and the output. And if, it, if an index does not appear in the output, that means we sum over it which is the Einstein summation convention. Um, so uh, I could, of course, give multiple talks on how Cyclops actually works underneath, but I'm not going to talk about much today. I'll just say that the best distributed contraction algorithm is selected at runtime via performance models. Uh, uh, distributed memory systems are the focus, but OpenMP and GPUs are also supported. And we have an interface to scale a fact if we want to do matrix computations. For more details on that, please see uh, uh, papers on that topic. Um, so initially, when we implemented uh, uh, CTF, the, the main application we were targeting was these couple cluster methods, the CCAD and CCATT. So these are results now are quite old. They go back to 2013 or 2014, but we showed that we can achieve, in a sense, better scale performance for a couple cluster methods and the contractions therein uh, using this library, both for CCASD and for CCATT, which includes higher order tensors and has a lesser arithmetic intensity. So less uh, floating point operations per uh, memory access. So it's harder to make it. And we, will, we also showed um, uh, that we're faster than alternative libraries, uh, such as NWCAM in particular, which is the standard uh, library for these things. Um, OK, so that's uh, tensor contractions, uh, although we'll come back to them a little bit more too. Um, now I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, tensor decomposition and our results there. So uh, kind of we've already talked a little bit about what a tensor is and what a canonical polyadic decomposition is. Here's also another picture that helps us visualize a little bit what CP does. So here, uh, the factors are uh, broken up uh, by their column. So we can see that uh, what we're really doing is uh, trying to model the tensor X as a sum of tensor products of vectors. So the most widely used approach to actually computing the CPD composition given a tensor X uh, is the alternating least squares algorithm, which fixes two of the factor, factor matrices, for example, B and C, and it finds the best choice of A for all of the columns at once. Um, and to find the best choice of A, one has to solve a quadratic optimization problem. Uh, and to do that, one does some tensor contractions uh, and a linear system solve. Um, an alternative to alternating least squares is uh, the use of Gauss-Newton methods, uh, which come from nonlinear least squares problems. And this is a nonlinear least squares problem. So this is kind of a standard black box approach. Uh, but with careful use of it, it actually also turns out to have some advantages. Um, it's, 
the disadvantage relative to ALS is that by using quadratic optimization uh, on the subset of vari variables, ALS always decreases the objective function, uh, which is the residual in this case, uh, while Gauss-Newton may not. However, Gauss-Newton optimizes all factor matrices at once and could achieve quadratic conversions. So uh, one of the things that uh, Lynch and Ma in, in our group has done over the past uh, couple of years is develop an approach to approximate alternating least squares using the, what we call the pairwise perturbation technique, uh, where we expand based on some previous state uh, what the ALS update is in terms of perturbations. And we use kind of the previous state in so far as possible to approximate the update and avoid recomp kind of computing some rather expensive terms. Uh, and in fact, we're able to avoid kind of punching the original tensor altogether and recomputing some of the most expensive terms once the algorithm gets going. Uh, of course, the perturbative uh, expansion is only accurate up to some amount of change. So we have to every once in a while restart. Um, but what we've shown is that this approximate step can be a lot faster. So even for an order three tensor, uh, we can get something like a factor of 10 speed up. And for a higher order, so for an order five tensor, by uh, lowering the complexity to something that's independent of the number of modes in the tensor, we can get something like 30x speed ups for how a little an ALS iteration uh, done approximately costs relative to the original uh, ALS iteration. Um, we also see in practice, so here on the right is actually a, a density feeding intermediate tensor obtained from uh, a sample system uh, run using uh, Cyclops on uh, several nodes, or maybe 60 nodes, I think, of uh, Stampede 2. Uh, this PP for West perturbation approach uh, converges in almost half of the time that ALS uh, does uh, to, to do the accuracy desired here. Um, and our paper lists a number of other examples where PP uh, outperforms um, ALS on overall models. Um, a, a different uh, approach we've also been studying for uh, CP decomposition is to use Gauss-Newton uh, with implicit conjugate gradient. So the problem is if you actually form the, the Gauss-Newton linear least squares problem, uh, which tries to update every uh, factor matrix at each step by using a quadratic approximation of the objective, uh, that system is prohibitively large in size, and you can't really solve it directly without sacrificing a lot of memory and a lot of cost. However, if you use implicit conjugate gradient, which means you uh, don't actually form the matrix, but you implicitly apply it onto a vector in order to solve the linear system that we need for Gauss-Newton, uh, the resulting method ends up looking like a bunch of tensor contractions, which we can implement efficiently. Uh, so one of the things we have observed is that actually this Gauss-Newton method is uh, able to converge uh, to exact solutions of CPD compositions uh, for problems where ALS almost never finds them. So here the conversion probability is almost zero for ALS, but something very much non-zero for Gauss-Newton. And we actually get, in some cases, much higher accuracy with Gauss-Newton than ALS. Uh, for tensors of interest. So here again, this is a density fitting quantum chemistry tensor. Uh, and GN at some point just jumps with quadratic convergence and achieves a much higher uh, fitness uh, uh, relative to ALS. Um, I think that's the end of kind of the tensor decomposition part. Is there any questions so far? It's also roughly in the middle of the talk. Doesn't look like anyone's put anything in the chat yet. Okay, uh, I'll go ahead. Okay. Um, probably should have had this earlier, but the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is this permutational symmetry. So we saw that in the two electron integral tensor, uh, we have a number of symmetries that are associated with interchange of modes. Uh, so one of the things that uh, we started studying also a number of years ago, uh, but actually was only finally published quite recently, uh, is how to leverage symmetry to reduce costs in tensor contractions. So um, in fact, it turned out that this is not a trivial problem and we oh, at first almost an accident discovered a kind of a new approach that turned out to general and be quite powerful. Uh, so to see why permutational symmetry does not trivially reduce the cost of contractions, we can consider the product of a symmetric matrix and a vector. Um, you could kind of try it yourself and see that it's not so easy to reduce the number of operations by a factor of two by leveraging the symmetry of the matrix, specifically because the equivalent entries in the matrix are being multiplied by different entries of X. Um, so what our approach does is it actually also for the symmetric matrix vector problem, but more generally for any contraction of symmetric tensors or anti-symmetric tensors, uh, it uh, reduces the number of products that the algorithm computes uh, by pretty much as much as you can relative to the symmetry. So for the case of symmetric matrix vector product by a factor of two, uh, for higher order contraction by something that grows vectorally in a number of modes. Um, and 
this reduces the number of products, but not the number of additions. So in a sense, we're doing fewer multiplications, but uh, actually maybe more operations overall. Uh, however, nevertheless, the algorithm can be nested uh, uh, to apply to higher order tensors that are partially symmetric, which is actually exactly what we have in quantum chemistry. And there it does reduce cost. Um, so kind of an example of how this algorithm looks like is that when we multiply two symmetric matrices, which it generally gives us something non-symmetric, so if we want to get a symmetric result, we need to symmetrize, uh, we can actually compute that differently. So usually we would actually have to do uncubed operations and we can't uh, exploit any of the symmetry. Uh, but instead, our approach says that one should compute multiplications that take a sum of these three entries and a sum of these three entries, which includes terms that we don't want, uh, but also includes all terms that we do want. And there's only uh, n choose three of these, so n cubed over six or so. Uh, and if we subtract out the terms that we don't want, uh, we actually get back to exactly what we need and all the stuff that we don't need uh, can always be done uh, and will always be computed in a lower order cost. Um, and this turns out to generalize for essentially all symmetric tensor contractions. Uh, so kind of choosing the number of modes to grow here, we see that the speed up is growing uh, accordingly. And here we're kind of looking at a restricted case when uh, one of these variables is zero. Um, but such cases are actually exactly what occurs in quantum chemistry, which is why I focused in. If we allow V to be non-zero, we get a much higher speed up actually. Um, we also see in practice that for a case, actually this AB plus BA, if we nest that, so if the each multiply in AB times uh, plus BA is itself a matrix multiplication, uh, we can get a speed up of almost, uh, I think a factor of 4.5. So we kind of approach this factor of six as predicted theoretically for a sufficiently large uh, matrix dimension. Um, so uh, that's permutational symmetry. The other type of symmetry I mentioned is group symmetry. Uh, uh, on this, we've been working quite recently uh, with uh, uh, Yang Gao and Philip Holmes and Garnett Chan at Caltech uh, to develop a new method uh, that tries to exploit group symmetry without actually using uh, sparse storage or iterating over equivalent uh, or symmetry blocks. And the idea here is that if we look at a tensor that has a group symmetry, which is kind of denoted here by, by these arrows, so the group symmetry would say, for example, that unless a plus b equals i plus j, the term is zero. And I plus J are, you might imagine, as indices that iterate over blocks. Um, they're not actually the full uh, tensor indices. So what our approach does, uh, and we call it irreducible representation alignment, is, uh, in a sense, break up the symmetry modes. Um, this is not really an SVD, so the box here remains over everything, but it's kind of an uh, SVD of the irreducible representation map, which describes uh, what indices are explicitly represented. But essentially, once we get to this form, what we do is we actually construct what's called a reducible representation uh, that only stores the unique elements of the tensor as a, you know, a smaller order tensor. And here by arrows, we denote the specific modes that we store. So A, Q, and J, and we don't store I and B. The standard reducible representations one would use would usually store ABI, ABJ, or BIJ, or AIJ, right? So some three modes of this original order for a tensor, and then the fourth mode can be found out implicitly. Um, so by using this weird uh, irreducible reduced form, uh, we're actually able to get to something that can be contracted efficiently, unlike the standard approaches. Uh, and to see that, we can kind of observe that if we do this to one tensor and to a second tensor with which we contract, so in general, these would be two different indices, but there is a conservation law that implies that everything going into this vertex must equal everything going out, and everything going in here must equal everything going out. So P has to basically equal Q. So we can actually make these the same, uh, which means that to contract these tensors, we can use Q as an index that appears in both the inputs and the output. Uh, and the result uh, is just a simple dense tensor contraction, uh, which holds so long as all the uh, uh, blocks uh, for the group symmetry are of the same size. So for details on what's going on, and it's reasonably complicated, so this is maybe not too helpful, uh, uh, I would encourage everybody to look at our paper, which should appear uh, sometime in July, uh, I think within two weeks. We also, and the reason we're very happy with this is that as a result, we can take uh, essentially arbitrary contractions with arbitrary group symmetry uh, and reduce them to uh, basic dense tensor contractions, which we know how to do very efficiently with Cyclops or with NumPy, uh, so with kind of blouse routines that are lower, lower level uh, matrix multiplications. 
And if we compare how this performs to how just looping over blocks and multiplying them performs, which has the same complexity, but has this level of interaction that kind of prevents easy parallelization, uh, we see that we generally obtain significant speed ups. So here time is on a, a log 16 scale. Uh, so kind of this actual bar is a factor of n speed up or so that's attained using the SimTensor approach with the irreducible representational lambda algorithm. Any questions about this before I go on? I know this might be of interest to a few folks here. I don't see any. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, with that, I'll actually then move on uh, to tensor networks. So tensor networks provide an alternative to Hartree-Fock-based methods uh, uh, in quantum chemistry, uh, but also they allow one to kind of very nicely model spin systems, uh, such as the transverse field Ising model, which looks something like this, where H is written. Uh, as a sum of local operators, as we had discussed before, where this uh, IJ bracket notation uh, means that IJ are neighboring sites on the lattice, uh, and uh, this is a local operator that's acting on those sites. Um, so if we just consider the 1D case where we only couple things if I and J are I and I plus one, uh, then we can write this as uh, Z, Kronecker product Z, Kronecker product identity, and a bunch more identities then shift that by one, Z chronic or product Z. So here I'm just kind of writing uh, these terms. Uh, and what I want to show is that uh, if we consider the uh, matrix product state factorization, uh, which is really taking an SVD and breaking up modes uh, uh, you know, into halves for every kind of partition of halves along uh, some line, uh, then from this factorization, we can see that uh, uh, the matrix product state should be low rank. In particular, if we consider some term with Zs, we can take all previous terms, which all had identities on the right, and all subsequent terms, which all have identities on the left. Uh, and we can, in a sense, think of those as uh, just two outer products. So those are rank two terms, since a Kronecker product is really nothing but an outer product. So in a sense, what one finds is that uh, uh, such Hamiltonians are separable uh, between each of these operators with a kind of a low connectivity which gives us this matrix product state type factorization. Um, in particular, it gives us the matrix product operator factorization, since each one of these is a matrix that acts and produces uh, kind of, and these are called physical modes, while these are bond dimensions. So I think uh, using the argument I just sketched, one can get rank three, but I think even lower rank might be possible. And how to actually optimize that is, is an argument itself. Um, so one can think about, and most commonly people work with these matrix product states and matrix product operators. But instead, one can also consider a uh, projected untangled pair state, which is just a 2D tensor network, uh, and a PEP O, a projected, state, projected entangled pair state operator, uh, which acts on these to produce a new one. Um, and again, uh, the reason we want to use these is because uh, physical Hamiltonians of interest can all actually be represented in this way. There, it's very easy to do when there's spin Hamiltonians. Uh, if they're uh, fermionic uh, systems, then we would need to do more complicated embeddings, but such forms are actually still attainable and the resulting methods are still of interest. So um, the most common approach to actually uh, using this form is the density matrix renormalization group, the DMRG algorithm, uh, where we represent, again, the wave function as uh, this matrix product state. We write the Hamiltonian as a matrix product operator, so this is something we're given and we can usually obtain for many systems of interest. Uh, and then we want to say that the expectation value psi h psi is equal to e psi psi. Um, so we, we want to basically perform this minimization of e. And to do that, what the DMRG algorithm does is it sweeps left and right and optimizes a couple of sites of this matrix product state. So here below and above are the same sites. And we, in a sense, are solving uh, a reduced eigenvalue problem or a reduced optimization problem, depending on the way you look at it, um, for two sites at a time. One can also do one side at a time, but two sides is a little bit more robust. Uh, to do that, one forms what's called the environment, which is uh, in, in DMRG, there's a left environment and a right environment. So these are the two red uh, uh, circles here. And then uh, actually does uh, an implicit iterative method to uh, compute the best choice uh, of this uh, orange box, which updates two factor matrices. Once that's found, one can factorize it by SVD and obtain the updated sites. And then DMRG moves on to the neighboring sites. And by sweeping back and forth, uh, DMRG is able to save much of the intermediates it needs, and it's fairly cheap to go from site to site. And in fact, this another advantage is one can uh, use what's called a canonical form, 
uh, which ensures that this environment overall acts as an orthogonal uh, projection. Uh, and that means that whatever error we make, for example, in this SVD approximation, uh, will not uh, grow too much to amplify the error to the overall state that we're seeking to approximate. So we uh, uh, recently implemented DMRG, in particular, Brian Levy and Brian Clark uh, worked uh, with me to obtain an implementation of DMRG uh, that uh, leverages group symmetry and uses uh, Cyclops. Uh, and we studied two approaches to leveraging group symmetry. One is to simply iterate over blocks and contract each block in parallel. Uh, and the other approach is to uh, use CTF spar uh, sparse tensor representation, which is designed for general sparse tensors uh, and not necessarily block sparse tensors as we have here. So uh, kind of here's a little uh, a cartoon of what the uh, uh, sparse block sparse group symmetric tensor might look like. And so in the list method, we're in a sense compressing this uh, and just iterating over each block and multiplying blockwise. While in the sparse tensor method, we uh, actually put all the blocks inside uh, a big tensor and multiply them together. Uh, what we observe generally is that the list method actually performs better and the overhead of using sparsity is kind of high, although the sparse method does achieve better strong scaling and so can achieve a higher performance rate overall. Um, the we also do, the fact that we have to iterate over blocks or leverage sparsity does hurt the efficiency relative to an optimized sequential code. Here we compare it to iTensor. And so on a small number of nodes, we're a fraction of the efficiency of iTensor. But actually, as we grow to larger problems, in particular, as we increase the bond dimension uh, and also increase the number of nodes, we're actually using more processors. Um, we can find, uh, we gradually approach the efficiency obtained by iTensor. And what we found is actually for really large DMRG uh, uh, problems, we are running at an efficiency that's comparable to the sequential efficiency or even better sometimes, uh, and uh, uh, kind of achieving, doing the same number of computations and running a much larger problem. Um, and so this will appear also actually quite shortly. We're about to release this sometime in July, uh, actually probably this week. Uh, okay. So uh, we've also done a little bit of work uh, on the theory side of studying the uh, stability and conditioning of tensor networks. So in particular, we saw that canonical forms in uh, DMRG are used in order to uh, prevent the amplification of error. Uh, and what we asked is a little bit more generally, what, what happens with arbitrary tensor networks? And what happens if we don't have a canonical form? We, we just have some arbitrary environment tensor. So here, N is the contraction of everything except this E site, uh, where legs connected to the E site are, in, are folded into uh, columns of the matrix and uh, the legs that are external are folded into rows. And what we essentially found is that one can bound the error uh, uh, by looking at the condition number of this matrix um, or kind of one can get also more refined bounds. Um, and we did this kind of reasonably rigorously. So now one can uh, consider studying uh, methods that approximate canonical forms instead of computing them exactly. Uh, so, uh, so as to just improve the conditioning of the environment matrix as, opp as opposed to make the conditioning perfect. Um, yeah. Something else I wanted to say, but uh, I shouldn't talk. Um, right, so uh, on the more practical side, one question we asked is, okay, well, could we actually try to automatically generate some of these methods? Uh, because uh, they have a, a number of commonalities uh, that uh, which in principle make them prone to just being derived by automatic differentiation. Uh, so we can always define some kind of objective function that says this tensor network uh, uh, must minimize this, um, or this tensor decomposition must minimize this residual, uh, and that can be written as some kind of tensor Einstein expression, so by Einstein, I mean Einstein summation. Um, and uh, then what we could do is differentiate that uh, expression to compute uh, and differentiate it again if we want something like the Hessian. Uh, and that, in principle, is all we really need to go to do DMRG and to do this alternating least squares for CP decomposition and also to do Gauss Newton. We just need to be able to say, uh, differentiate with respect to this subset of variables and maybe differentiate again and then solve this linear system. Uh, but of course, life is kind of hard because uh, a big part of the thing we want to do is to cache intermediates between different optimization steps in our alternating optimization procedure. Uh, so uh, using AD for tensor computation then spawns this problem of finding the best order of tensor contractions, but also uh, being able to actually understand tensor algebra and associated identities, such as the fact that the inverse is distributed over the Kronecker product, uh, which is actually critical to uh, deriving the fact that 
uh, in ALS, uh, the CPD composition quadratic subproblem can be solved very cheaply uh, and not by forming some chronic product with two matrices and then inverting it. Um, so as a result, uh, 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 implemented a, a library we call AutoHoot, uh, Automatic High Order Optimization for Tensors, uh, which is a, kind of an AD engine that's tensor-centric. Uh, and uh, what we have seen is that it outperforms state-of-the-art libraries. So of course, actually TensorFlow is quite known for doing automatic differentiation, but when you look at what they're doing, it's really focused on deep learning, where you have just matrix vector products and chains of them or collections of them. Uh, and it doesn't really understand how to do higher order optimization or how to use tensor identities. Uh, and if you try to use it for tensor decompositions or tensor networks, it will generally fail miserably. Uh, and what we see is much higher performance for the same kernels because we get the algebra right and we essentially derive the optimal method uh, automatically by using appropriate transformations of the resulting tensors. Uh, most impressively to me, I think, is that we were actually able to generate DMRG automatically and DMRG has this complicated sequence of intermediates that need to be cached, uh, but the algorithm that Lynch and Jagu implemented to optimize the contraction order is capable of finding that. And what we find is that the library is competitive to Quim, uh, which is a state-of-the-art library for a DMRG. So here rank is the bond dimension used uh, uh, in DMRG. Um, and we are observing how little the eigenvalue uh, gets to after some period of time. And essentially we see that Autohood and Quim compete the same thing, but Autohood is just a tiny bit slower. Um, although I think on some other primitives like uh, Hessian vector product, Autohood is actually faster than Quim. Uh, and also when we compare it to the tensor decomposition libraries, we found that Autohood can outperform some of the state-of-the-art Python libraries uh, due to the optimizations we did. Um, so this HVP, Hessian vector product, which is a, a key thing that we use in AD, uh, is also something that we can now uh, achieve good scalability for. So here we do weak scaling where we increase the number of nodes. And uh, this gray line shows the ideal scaling because we're also increasing uh, the number of flops we're doing. Uh, and we're able to get quite close to that, uh, actually even a little bit better than the theoretical ideal um, uh, by using CTF. And it's easy to use CTF because Autohood works at this high level of abstraction of just optimizing order of tensor computations. And it works hard to preserve the overall structure of the computation, which is something that alternatives such as JAX actually don't do and break stuff up into parts, which hurts us in the end. Okay, um, so with that, I want to now talk a little bit about tensor network state-based simulations. Um, so uh, these are kind of an alternative one can think of to DMRG. In DMRG, we uh, uh, fix a problem and use alternating optimization. Uh, in tensor network state evolution, we uh, start with, for example, an MPS or PUPS, and then we gradually evolve it to get to a ground state or to do dynamics. Uh, and so this is kind of a natural way to do dynamics with tensor network. So we want to involve it in physical time, uh, but we can also compute ground states by doing what's called imaginary time evolution. And it's called imaginary time because it differs by dynamics by replacing T with I times T. Um, but really what this is doing is simply transforming the eigenvalues so that the largest eigenvalue of the resulting uh, matrix E to the minus uh, H tau is the smallest eigenvalue of the original matrix, which is the one we wanted to get. Uh, and consequently it suffices to just multiply uh, by this operator over and over to converge to the desired ground state, which is now kind of uh, uh, the state with a, that's hot, that is the dominant eigenvector of the matrix. Um, and uh, a caveat of how we're in time evolution is, and the reason this kind of works is that what we do is we uh, trotterize, so we take small time steps uh, uh, in order to update the state. And these have to be small in order for uh, the approximation to, uh, to allow us to break this H up into local terms. And by uh, breaking this H up into a product of local operators, uh, the exponential actually still keeps them local and doesn't uh, make too many problems. Uh, we're able to uh, apply these operators uh, in sequence uh, and do it as just a simple tensor network. Uh, so this is kind of an alternative of taking H and embedding it in MPO. This produces a tensor network from H that can be efficiently applied uh, uh, by using uh, this Trotter approximation. So the caveat is tau has to be sufficiently small. So we may have to take a lot of steps uh, uh, to actually get to the right eigenvalue since the larger the step we take, the more progress we're making here. Okay. So uh, something very similar actually happens when we simulate quantum circuits. 
uh, tensor network state simulation is one way to do that, and we'll talk about how uh, we actually do that shortly. But one can also simply think about a quantum circuit as being representable by a tensor network. Uh, so given some circuit representation like this, we can just imagine a, a tensor network diagram that is described uh, here on the right. So in fact, to simulate a quantum circuit, it suffices to contract this tensor network, uh, which in some cases uh, can be a lot cheaper than actually uh, forming the state explicitly uh, and applying transformations to it. Uh, but a question that arises, why do we actually want to use HPC to simulate quantum circuits? Since we know that uh, as we increase the size of the circuit, the complexity is expected to grow exponentially. Uh, so I think there's a number of reasons. Uh, one is to enable uh, testing and development of new quantum algorithms uh, at, and ones that are kind of larger than before. So one actually wants to run a larger quantum circuit to test it out. Uh, another is to understand to what degree different algorithms and different systems we might run the algorithm on are approximal in a classical way. Uh, yet another reason is to quantify the effect of noise and error on uh, what the algorithm actually is computing, uh, which allows us to study perhaps to, to what degree an algorithm is uh, uh, impervious to noise. Uh, and I, I think, although you know, perhaps this is not made concrete, that uh, being able to do large scale tensor network uh, optimization and simulation uh, would couple and pro potentially provide a way to do hybrid quantum classical algorithms, since I think the main way that a, a classical and quantum computer can communicate is in a way is essentially by providing descriptions of circuits. Um, uh, and by being able to optimize circuits more efficiently, I think they should pave the path toward new techniques there. So Cyclops actually, before I even kind of got involved in quantum computing was used to simulate uh, a very large 49 qubit uh, circuit by uh, a team composed of IBM and Lawrence Livermore researchers who kind of included me because I just helped them out with debugging. Uh, and they do this by kind of looking at the overall tensor network and using hypergraph partitioning to subdivide it into parts that are more efficiently contractible. Uh, and also separately, uh, a team composed of uh, a, a number of researchers from China and Singapore uh, did an exact PEPS uh, uh, simulation of a quantum circuit of about the same size um, using PEPS. Uh, and both of these were exact, so they tried to make no approximation. Uh, what we'll do is uh, study how to do things approximately um, but before that, maybe let me quickly explain how tensors can actually be used to represent the state of a quantum circuit. Uh, so here we have psi now representing a quantum, uh, a quantum computer state with n qubits. Uh, so this is uh, in general a vector. Uh, we can write it in this form. So it's a linear combination of a bunch of states and the amplitudes uh, uh, define the coefficients of that linear combination. Uh, so these t's are what we actually uh, can use to represent the state fully. And so a, uh, one of the most naive approaches to quantum circuit simulations is to just form this tensor uh, and to apply gates to it, which uh, correspond simply to contractions over one or two modes to produce a new T. So that's also called the state vector simulation. What, uh, uh, if we want to do a tensor network state simulation, uh, what we'll do is impose some kind of structure onto T, for example, say it's an MPS or say it's a PUPS, and then evolve that uh, exactly or approximately by application of gates. Um, so uh, we then pursued kind of a PEPS-based simulation of uh, 2D quantum circuits and 2D systems in general. Uh, this is attractive because near-term quantum architectures are uh, mostly 2D, uh, and these can handle non-local gates by swap gates. Um, so 2D tensor networks that also then provide a natural way to simulate these. Um, so we, while pursuing kind of uh, this PEPS simulator, we have both applications that are relevant to uh, quantum chemistry and classical simulation of quantum systems, as well as applications that are relevant to uh, quantum computing. Um, and since we're doing this PEPS simulation, what we can note is that we'll, we'll need to contract the PEPS at some point. And if we do it exactly, that requires exponential cost that can be done, but that's never going to scale too much out. So what we'll pursue is to do things approximately. Uh, so uh, to do gate application, there is a known approach that works quite well. So if we have two sides and we want to apply a two side gate, one side gates are easy, so I skipped them. Uh, what we'll do is compute a QR factorization of these tensors for some matrixization that appropriately breaks up the modes. Then we'll take these R factors, which are much smaller. Uh, we'll contract them with the gate uh, to obtain this two side thing, then we'll do SVD to break it into parts and we'll do truncation here as needed. Uh, and this is reasonably effective because Q here is orthogonal. So the, the approximation should not 
be amplified too much, at least locally, and that gets us to updated states. So we implemented a distributed memory version of this that's uh, a bit smarter uh, and leverages the fact that these R's are actually quite small. Uh, sorry about that. Um, and, but also what we note is that the fundamental operation we're doing here will from now refer to as Einsam SVD. We want to contract and then refactorize. So this contraction and then refactorization via usually SVD uh, also pops up if you want to contract, uh, uh, pops into a scalar uh, and is quite useful for tensor network computations in general. Uh, so we develop an efficient implementation for this that's quite general based on, again, these ideas of implicitly uh, optimizing. Uh, and uh, in particular, what we do can be uh, interpreted as a randomized SVD algorithm with implicit representation of the matrix. So we think about this thing as a matrix and we multiply it by an, a guess at what the factor might look like. Then we do a QR of that and then we repeat and that converges uh, rather quickly to uh, the desired result. And the point is that one of these uh, uh, operations, so one of such a kind of contraction and then QR can be uh, a lot less expensive and asymptotically so uh, than actually contracting this together and then computing the SVD. So in particular, when we contract the PEPs, for example, to compute an inner product of states, which will need to compute an estimate of the energy for a PEPs, uh, so an expectation value, uh, a common way to do this is boundary contraction, which starts at the top uh, and contracts things down and down row by row. Uh, and as we sweep from left to right, the fundamental primitive that we're doing is taking three tensors and contracting them and refactorizing them with a lower rank, um, for whatever rank we want to bound to achieve the degree of approximation that we need. Uh, and this again is an Einsam SVD. And in fact, using uh, implicit randomized Einsam SVD uh, allows us to reduce the complexity of this step uh, asymptotically and get to a PEPS contraction method uh, uh, that is efficient and easy to implement. Um, one thing we need, as, as kind of noted before, is these expectation values. And so to compute an expectation value of H, we can compute the expectation value of each of the local operators and then sum. Uh, but then we would be doing M PEPS contractions for M terms. So to do better, what we developed is a caching strategy that allows for operators that are nearby to reuse the same intermediates. And in fact, what we do is really sweep down and apply all local operators for each row and then sweep until the next row. So that, in a sense, reduces the number of PEPs contractions we want to do uh, by a factor of uh, the square root of the number of sites, or really a factor of the number of terms we want to compute, uh, modulo a constant. So in practice, of course, this is a big speed up once we increase the size of the PEPs. Um, so an alternative approach to doing this is actually to use trotterization and compute an expectation value of uh, a time evolution operator. Uh, but this has an advantage that if you actually want to compute uh, not just the sum of the expectation values of the local operators, but the expectation values themselves in collection, uh, which is essentially what you want if you want a gradient, uh, we can also do that with this caching mechanism. So uh, 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 we developed this as part of the Koala library, which is a Python-based library for PUP simulation that has backends that can use uh, CPU, GPU, or supercomputer. Uh, the, the latter, again, using Cyclops, so here back in CTF, the Cyclops. Um, and these allow one to apply gates as well as to define a PEPS state uh, and then compute expectation values that uses caching as well as a variety of contraction algorithms. So this is an easy to use simulator for these types of systems. Um, so if we look at how this performs, uh, we obtain good strong scaling. So here we fix the problem size and increase the number of nodes for both evolution uh, of a PEPS, so application of a gate, and contraction, here we start a larger problem and we again scale down until some limit. Um, so that means we get kind of good parallel scalability. In our paper, we also look at weak scaling, so increasing the problem size as well. Um, we also looked at using this for approximation of random quantum circuits, uh, so Google's random quantum circuits, which are designed to be hard to approximate. Sorry, I'm uh, pretty much over time, uh, but I'm almost done. Uh, and what we see is that as we increase the bond dimension of the PEPs, uh, we can get the relative error to uh, essentially become round off, uh, but also we can get a little bit of fidelity even for uh, PEPs uh, that are quite large. So this is n equals seven uh, qubits. So this is a 49 by 49 uh, uh, quantum circuit. And we're using a fairly small amount of nodes to simulate that uh, uh, with the PEPs. Uh, and we get some amount of fidelity even with a bond dimension that's not exact. Um, we get uh, much better accuracy when we consider specific uh, algorithms that are not you know, just designed to make simulation hard. Uh, so in particular, we considered uh, ITE 
uh, which is not a quantum algorithm, but just measuring time evolution. And here we see kind of as expected that with increased bond dimension, we get closer and closer to what would be computed by state vector, which is kind of exact here. Uh, and we also consider uh, uh, the variational quantum eigensolver, which is a quantum algorithm. So we simulate this algorithm using a tensor network and we uh, contract the tensor networks approximately to compute uh, everything at every stage of the algorithm. And what we find is that as we increase the bond dimension, uh, we do better at finding the right solutions in general. Although it's not, uh, it's not always a clean win. So sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Um, and we're still trying to work towards scaling this up to uh, uh, bigger systems of larger numbers of qubits uh, because both VQ and ITE require a very large number of iterations and contractions to actually get a precise energy. Um, okay, so hopefully I convinced you that our group is doing a whole lot of stuff in, uh, uh, in tensor algorithms and computations uh, and that this stuff um, is important for simulation of quantum systems as well as for quantum computing more broadly. Uh, so finally, let me leap, leap up these acknowledgments uh, and especially thank uh, uh, my group and my collaborators for giving us this work. Thanks. Thanks, Edgar, um, for an interesting talk. Let's see, have we got anyone uh, who has any questions? Go, feel free to pipe up. Um, I have one. You briefly mentioned uh, that this might be useful for hybrid classical quantum uh, systems. What, what, what are you thinking with that? Um, yeah, so I guess uh, that's, that's the one part where I, I, I perhaps can't be too concrete, but I guess one might imagine that um, you could optimize, uh, for example, VQE first uh, uh, and obtain a better circuit description on a quantum computer, uh, on, on a classical HPC system than on the quantum computer you want to test, and you can also cross-validate results between the two systems. Um, but I think there's an interesting question of if you have a large HPC system and if you have one, one or many quantum computers, how do you kind of leverage both in an effective way? Um, and I think in part because modern uh, quantum algorithms such as VQE, so these near-term quantum algorithms are based on optimizing uh, circuit descriptions, that if we're able to optimize tensor network versions of them, that should be useful. But yes, I don't have a concrete algorithm in mind for, uh, okay. for that. Yeah. Anybody else? Hey, Edgar. Enjoy the talk. A question uh, is, can your techniques also be applied for, say, approximate tensor decompositions? Yes, yes, uh, certainly. So uh, the, for quantum chemistry, actually, the problems we, we looked at are approximate. Uh, uh, so we're trying to kind of, to the, as best as we can, lower the residual of that approximation for the tensor. So we've also, we're, also, we're also looking at tensor decompositions of you know, tensors that arise for completely different reasons. Uh, so anything from you know, Netflix data sets to uh, tensors that uh, describe the spread of infectious disease uh, to quantum chemistry. Um, but also there are interesting problems when one does want an exact factorization. I guess, as you know, to discover bilinear algorithms, one could use that. So we've been also looking at how to make tensor decompositions more robust in that case. And we've found that Gauss-Newton is actually quite good. Uh, so we're trying to now push Gauss-Newton to perhaps try to find new bilinear algorithms. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Not. Um, thank you all for coming. Anyone who's interested, I think Edgar will hang out for a few minutes and see if anyone wants to hang out and, and chat about any of these ideas. Um, and we will look forward to seeing you next week for Paul Quia.